nights. YA is my favorite night of the week. I think this is the best possible way anybody could spend their Thursday night. Um, for those of you that might not know me, like Connor said, my name is Milana, and I am just one of the people on the team here at Red Rocks Young Adults. It's the best job I've ever had. I love it. I'm obsessed with it. I have to real quick give a shout out to my amazing production volunteers. Yes, give it up for them. They are the best. They're holding down the fort tonight. They're amazing. I love my production volunteers. They're the best, and production is the best place to volunteer at YA. Sorry, Zach. I said what I said. Um, <laughs> I know Connor already did this, but do me a favor. If it's your first time, can you slip up your hand? I'm not going to embarrass you. Yes, welcome. Welcome, you guys. We're so excited that you are here with us tonight. Like I said, there are a lot of ways that you could spend a Thursday night as a young adult in Denver, especially this time of the year. So we're just glad that you are here. I remember my first time, I sat like all by myself over here and it was really overwhelming walking into a room full of hundreds of other young adults. And I remember feeling really overwhelmed, but YA and Red Rocks quickly became my family. It became a home for me. And so that is our hope. That is our prayer for you, is that you would walk out of here tonight feeling like you are part of a family, that this is your home. That's our goal at Red Rocks Church. Yeah. You guys, it's already December. Like, it's already the end of the year. Can you believe it? Some of you, some of you are like, yes, it's been a really long year, okay? <laughs> for me, I, like, can't believe it because it hasn't snowed yet. And I'm, like, really confused. I'm like, where is it? I remember growing I've been in Denver my whole life. And I remember growing up, and I don't, I, as far as I can remember, I don't think we've ever made it to December, like, without one single snow. I actually specifically remember this because it usually always snows on Halloween. Like, that's usually the first snow I remember. Because when I was little, it used to piss me off that I'd have to wear my snow coat and my snow boots over my Princess Jasmine costume, okay? <laughs> so I don't know where the snow is, and I'm not, like, super, super crazy about the snow, but I want a white Christmas, right, you guys? Like, where is it? Pray for snow. Pray for snow with me. Um, but with or without the snow, we decided to kick off our Christmas mini series last week. Like Connor said, he preached last week and he preached an amazing, amazing message. Yes, if you were here, it was incredible. It was so good. He talked about how we can sometimes approach this Christmas season and we can sort of miss the point of why we are celebrating in the first place. He talked about how in John, um, People almost miss Jesus because they didn't recognize him and how we can sometimes go into Christmas season and almost miss Jesus. And that is like a really horrible summary. Go back and listen to it because it's way better. Um, it's titled Missing the Point. It's on our YouTube page. I feel like he could have called it like Jesus is the reason for the season. So that was like a missed opportunity there, Connor. <laughs> but the point is um, we wanted to do this series on Christmas and take some time leading up to Christmas services at Red Rocks and just sort of ready our hearts and talk about the story of Christmas and this amazing story, which I think is arguably the most famous story across the world. And I think growing up, I was raised in like a really traditional church, like pews, we sang hymns out of hymn books, like people put the communion cracker like right in your mouth. If you, if you know what I mean, come talk to me. We probably have a lot to talk about. <laughs> But I remember growing up and sort of approaching Christmas and the birth of Jesus, being born of a Virgin Mary and singing songs like Silent Night and Oh Holy Night, and never really questioning it. Or what I mean by that is never like sort of just taking it for what it was, you know, like never really digging deeper. And I just would think like, that's awesome. Like this is such a great and peaceful and hopeful story and wonderful time, right? Like little baby Jesus, like so sweet, like great, I love babies. My mom would like make us like sing a song around her nativity scene. And I just sort of like took it for what it was. And I think I just sort of maybe skipped past what it really meant for God's people, what it really means for you and for me. And so tonight, I want to talk a little bit more about the story of Christmas and what it really meant for Jesus to come to earth the way that he did. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2. If Does anybody have like a physical Bible? We make this joke so much. Okay, amazing. You're holier than me, okay? 
my, <laughs> I'm serious. My husband and I like visited a church in Minnesota a couple weeks ago and they're like, okay, get out your Bibles. And I swear like everybody around me like just pulled this giant heavy duty leather Bible out of nowhere. You know, like it had tabs, they were highlighted. And I like got out my like iPhone and opened my Bible app like really shamefully and I instantly felt less holy. So if that's in, you in here not and you have the Bible app, wave it loud and proud. I am with you. <laughs> I am one of you. It is the same book, just a lot less heavy and a little less holy. I'm kidding. Luke chapter 2 is where we will be. And this is the story of Jesus' birth as told by Luke. And we're going to be starting in verse 4. If you don't have it with you, it will be up on the screen. Starting in verse 4, it says, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all of the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. The title of my message, if you're taking notes tonight, is An Unexpected Miracle. An Unexpected Miracle. Let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you so much that you are in this room tonight. Just like Connor said, where two or more are gathered, Lord, there you are also. And so, God, we rejoice in the fact that we get to just spend time with you tonight, worshiping you praising you, reading your word, Jesus. I just pray that you would speak to your people tonight, God. We are desperate to hear from you, Lord. We love you. We praise you. It is our honor to gather like this on a Thursday night. And everybody at Red Rocks YA said, amen and amen. Thank you, Scott. Give it up for Scott Miller. <laughs> I had to just because I know that he hates attention and I love Scott. Okay, I have a question for you guys. Have any of you ever had like really high expectations for something just for it to show up in a way that maybe you never expected? Okay, like what I'm talking about is like you've really, really like high hopes for something and then the reality just is somewhat sort of like a letdown. Okay, I think we, I think most of us have been there. Maybe for you in the room tonight, you dabble in the world of like online dating. Yeah, <laughs> we got some old. <laughs> I'm not going to call you out, I swear. I'll try. Um, and so you, like, swipe right for that one guy or that one girl, and you, like, are anticipating your first date, and you guys are, like, DMing, and you're like, oh, my gosh, we like all the same shows. We both have the same, like, favorite foods. Like, this is the one. And so you're, like, hyping it up, and then you just show up to your first date only to find out that they, like, look nothing like their profile picture, like you were totally catfished, the date goes horrible, it's awful. I'm sorry if that's you in this room. I, I'm not going to say any names. Um, or, maybe, <laughs> or maybe for you, um, you feel this with movies, right? Like this is my husband to a T. Like he gets so excited and has these big expectations for these movies. He still hasn't seen the new, um, what's it called? James Bond? James Bond. <laughs> I haven't seen those, obviously. And he's nervous because he's afraid it's going to be a letdown. But you know how it is. Like, you see all the commercials. You get so hyped for it. You go to the movies. You get your tickets. You got your popcorn. And then, like, end credits roll. And you're like, what was that? Like, I just paid money for that. I Listen, preteen me felt this hard with the Twilight Saga, okay? Yes, I I was devastated, okay? Like, 13-year-old me, like, poured my tears into the pages of those books, okay? And I was let down, Team Edward. Um, <laughs> I know the way, I feel like we've all experienced this in some way, shape, or form, but I know the way that I feel this most is through online shopping, okay? <laughs> 
And I am, like, avoiding all eye contact with my husband right now because he's probably just, like, rolling his eyes and shaking his head. Um, I will be the first to say, other than Jake, that I have an online shopping problem, okay? Like, it, it is a problem, you guys. Like, I am the person that has, like, all the clothing brand apps, like, downloaded to my phone, like H&M, Zara, Nordstrom, whatever, you name it. It is on my phone, and they are all in a folder on my home screen that's just titled, like, no, bad. And it doesn't stop me, okay? Like, I still get on them. It's terrible. I am the person that Instagram ads, like, I, I am the person they are targeting. Like, listen, I will click on that ad, and I will buy what is advertised to me right then and there. I don't ask permission. <laughs> it's bad, okay? Like, you guys, the people on Instagram who are data mining me, like, they know me. Like, they know me. Like, I'm an easy target, okay? And I love to online shop. I hate going to the mall. I'll go to Target, and that's about it. Otherwise, I just want to find what I like online and then have it sent right to my door, right? Super easy, and it's like a little present from me to me. And then I get all excited, and I'm waiting for it to come, and it's just this thrill, okay? And listen, I have this down to an art form, okay? Like, I know all my sizes in every different place, like the different shoe sizes for the different brands. Like, it has become my craft, okay? Like, I am a professional. It is an art form for me. And I was talking with Aaron Grimm the other day, actually on Sunday, because we had our staff Christmas party the next day. And I'm talking to her, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, what are you wearing? And all this stuff, and we're talking. And she's like, what are you wearing? And I was like, oh, I ordered this super cute dress online. Like, I am so excited. It's getting here today. And she was like, aren't you nervous? Like, when I online shop, like, I have to order something weeks in advance to, like, make sure that I like it or that it works or that it fits. And I... So I start to tell her about my craft, right? Like, I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm a professional. Like, I know. Like, this is, I'm so excited. It's so cute. So I feel like you probably know where this story is going. Um, I get home on that Sunday, and I open the dress, and it, I try it on, and it was not at all what I was expecting. You guys, listen, the sleeves were, like, longer than my arms. And it was not cute. And then I, it was supposed to be, like, knee length. And it, like, went all the way down to my ankles. And I was like, what is this? I was supposed to have, like, a cute belt that, like, wrapped around and was all, like, fashionable, tied in the front. It did not do that. Um, it was bad. And l there's a picture. That's not it, okay? That's not it. But... <laughs> Imagine this, but like 10 times worse, okay? Because there is no way I am showing you a picture of it because it was, it was that bad, okay? So after five to seven long business days of waiting, I, that I was so excited for this dress, waiting for something I was super excited for, it got here and was so disappointing. But I think that that sort of idea, this idea of like waiting and anticipation and eagerly for something just for it to come and not at all be what you expected or hoped for is something that we have all experienced. And I imagine that this is how God's people might have felt in the story that we just read about. You see, for centuries long, long before the birth of Jesus, God and like all throughout scripture would point to this Messiah that was coming, who would come and deliver God's people and establish a kingdom from like the very beginning, all the way back to Genesis in the garden, and then on and on for hundreds of years, God would give people these promises of this amazing Messiah. And for centuries, God's people held closely to these promises, okay? Like the entire narrative of the Old Testament sort of points to this overarching theme of this great leader and would point to this greater narrative of this Messiah and different stories of different leaders would just be foreshadowings for it. Leaders like Moses who would lead God's people out of slavery from Egypt through the Red Sea where God would part the Red Sea and Moses would lead them through with his rod and his staff and he would lead them into the promised land that God had promised them. Stories like David who was a young shepherd boy that would take on an enemy, a giant like Goliath, defeat him and become king, okay? All of these stories of these great, amazing leaders still weren't this amazing Messiah that God had promised his people. All of these great stories of triumph were still just foreshadowings 
of a king that would come and be even greater than any of these leaders. And God would actually give specific promises and specific glimpses into what this Messiah would look like, right? Like he would give prophetic words, characteristics, things that he would do, promises dating all the way back to Genesis, where God says that the Messiah will crush the enemy's head. And then for years and years on, more prophecies would come. In Isaiah, it says that he will do these amazing works. It says that the eyes of the blind will be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth from the wilderness and streams in the desert. Isaiah says that he will set captives free. In Isaiah 61, it says the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release darkness for the prisoners. It says in Isaiah 25 that he'll conquer death. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces, and he will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. Daniel claims in Daniel chapter 7 that he will have an everlasting throne It says that he has a vision. He looked, and there before him was one like the son of a man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. Sovereign power in all nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And I can only imagine... I know I get fired up reading that. I can only imagine how God's people at this time must have felt, how much hope, how much anticipation and expectancy they held onto for this promise. Years and years of promise, of promise, of all these stories of these leaders who were great but incomparable to this coming Messiah. And they waited 400 years, okay, 400 years hoping and waiting with high expectations just for their king, their Messiah, this promised Savior to come in the form of a baby. Years of waiting and waiting, expectant anticipation just for him to come as a baby. We read it earlier in Luke 2, chapter, or Luke 2, Verse 11 and 12, it says, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. A baby. God's people, after waiting that long for their Messiah, was given a baby. They were promised a king. They were promised a Messiah who was supposed to be greater than King David. He was supposed to be this amazing healer that would open the eyes of the blind and cure deafness and make lame people walk. And he was supposed to strike the head of the enemy and set all these captives free. Their king, their promised savior, a baby, a little crying baby, a baby who is helpless A baby that needs his mom, like a baby isn't a savior. A baby can't be this great thing, the great king, and especially not this baby. No, especially not this baby who was born to a no-name poor girl from Nazareth who had no, wasn't of noble birth, she wasn't royal. This baby who was born in a dirty barn in Bethlehem. This baby whose birth was celebrated just by these no-name shepherds. This baby who's lying in a dirty feeding trough that was made for animals. Surely, surely this could not have been the same Messiah that the prophets spoke of. Surely this was not the miracle that God had promised his people. 400 years of waiting. 400 years of hope and expectancy for this great promise that was given by God for years, years of words of prophecy and of narratives that would point to this Messiah just for him to come in the form of a baby. And I can only imagine how some of God's people might have been disappointed 
or maybe given up hope for this promise of this Messiah during their lifetime. I can only imagine after 400 years of waiting for this great miracle how they might have felt when it came in this way. When it came in the form of a little baby, I would imagine how disappointing that might have been. How easy it probably was for them to overlook this miracle and feel let down. 400 years. Now, none of us in here can relate to waiting that long for a miracle, but I think that I'm sure most of us can relate to feeling expectant for God to do something in your life, for waiting for what maybe feels like centuries, for God to do what you know he promised you he would do. Maybe for you, you've been like waiting for a new job opportunity. Like you're sitting here tonight and you're like, I need financial breakthrough. And like, God, where, where is it? Like it hasn't come. And you've waited and waited and still nothing. Or maybe for you, you've been like praying for your family to be saved. Like you've been praying and pleading with God and you've been inviting them to church and you've been just continually trying to be a positive light in their lives and you've prayed and you've asked God and you feel like you know that he's promised you that you will spend eternity with your family in heaven, but yet they still don't believe Or maybe you feel like God has promised you this healthy, happy, God-filled marriage because your parents went through a divorce and you don't ever want to experience something like that again. And so you know that God is going to redeem relationships through your future marriage, but you have been on date after date. You have prayed prayer after prayer, and yet you're still sitting here after years of being single wondering, where, where is it? Or maybe for you, you've dealt with anxiety and depression for what feels like forever as long as you can remember and you have heard that God is a healer and that he's able to heal you and you feel like he's promised you that he will end this war that goes on in between your ears but yet you're still sitting in here tonight anxious and depressed waiting for a miracle and disappointed And I've been wrestling with this idea all week um, and this story, wrestling with this story, because for us, years later, unlike the Israelites at this time, we know how it ends, right? Like, we know how the story ends. We know who that baby would become. We know what he would do. And so I think that because of that, so much so we over, we don't even think to, like, raise an eyebrow by, like, how God decided to send Jesus into the world, how he decided to send the Messiah into the world. And I think because of that, we can underappreciate this miracle. And we can overlook this specific part of the greatest miracle that God has ever done. And we can sometimes come into Christmas time and hear about this story that God did thousands of years ago and underappreciate why God brought about this miracle the way that he did in a way at the time that was probably wildly unexpected and maybe disappointing. But this miracle, this unexpected miracle, listen, young adult, when I tell you, this miracle for God, it had to be Jesus. It might have been unexpected or even disappointing at the time, but it had to be Jesus, okay? Because this miracle wasn't God just deciding on some random way to send the Messiah just because, like, he picked me, like, out of a hat. It wasn't just happenstance. It wasn't God just wanting to add, like, shock value with his people. No, God did this miracle. God did it this way for the best reason. And the reasoning dates back all the way to the very beginning, very beginning of the creation story. So if we could just take a quick quick journey through scripture with me for a moment. You see, in the beginning, we see in the creation story in Genesis that God created the earth. He created the heavens and the earth, and he created evening and morning and land and waters, and he created all living creatures in the sea and on the land, and then it says he created man, and he made us in his image and made us to rule over all his creation. It says in Genesis 127, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, 
Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So at the very start of creation, God created man and he blessed them, right? Like he promised all authority over this earth that he had created. He said that man shall rule and have dominion over all the earth. And he created this amazing world and he wanted to share it with us, right? Like he designed us with this authority. And then somewhere, at some point, we lost that authority. Okay, and our best bet at when this happened um, is in the garden during the fall of man, the story of um, Satan tempting Adam and Eve when man gave in to the temptation of the enemy and trusted the enemy's word over God's word and therefore forfeiting their authority over to Satan and allowing sin to come and enter this world that God had created. And from that point on, Satan was the prince of the world. And we know this because scripture calls him the prince of the world. And we, there's actually a story in Matthew 4 where Satan actually, Jesus is led out into the wilderness and Satan tempts Jesus. And he offers him the kingdoms of this world. He says, you can have all of this and all their splendor. And he says he can give it to Jesus. It says in Matthew 4, verse 8 through 9. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said, and this I will give to you if you will bow down and worship me. And if you read on in Matthew 4, you see and you can notice that Jesus actually never denies that he can do that. Like Jesus never denies the authority that Satan claimed to have over the earth because darkness and sin had entered into that world. And because of that sin, we were then separated from God with no authority over the world that he had originally created and given to us. And so in order for God to give this authority back to man, he didn't do it in a way where he just like reached down from heaven and like took it back and then like placed it back with us. No, that like was not good enough for God. For God saving us from a distance wasn't enough for him. For God knowing us from a distance wasn't enough for him anymore. Instead, He decided to do this miracle in a way where he actually became man in the form of a baby so that through the personhood of Jesus Christ, who was fully God and fully human, he went to the length of being born a humble human birth. He did it this way so that we could take on not, he could take on not only our human experience and live a perfect and sinless life, not only so that he could know us face to face from now on, he did it this way so that he could live his whole life healing people, doing all these miracles just like these prophecies we spoke about earlier said he would. He did it this way so that he himself could die on a cross, take on all the sin of humanity, defeat death, hell, and the grave. He did it this way so that he could die as man but be raised up from the dead as the king of kings and the lord of lords and be seated at the right hand of the father he did it this way so that through him becoming man and dying for the sin of the world we could then as man regain our authority back through him he did it this way so that now we not only have an earthly authority but because of his holy spirit we now carry a heavenly kingdom authority okay and we can never lose it ever again and hear me because it is sealed through the blood of Jesus Christ through the work on the cross and is held safe with him in his throne in heaven okay he did it this way to give us an eternity in heaven with him and so that we would never be separated from the love of God ever again listen how radical must God's love be for you that he would come as a baby He would humble himself as a baby and go these great lengths just to ensure that he would never have to be apart from you ever again. Young adult, hear me. It had to be Jesus. This miracle that God did, the Messiah that he promised the world, it had to be Jesus. God went a great distance for this miracle. And though it came in a way at the time that was maybe disappointing and unconventional, it was infinitely better 
and far more eternal than any miracle we could have ever hoped for or expected. This miracle, Jesus coming as a baby, was the furthest thing from disappointing. And I just, I wonder if there are any of us in here tonight and you're approaching this Christmas season and you're waiting for a miracle. And I, I just can't help but wonder if it's coming. But maybe, just maybe, I wonder if it's coming in a way that you never expected. I think about it. Like, God could have sent his son. He could have gave us Jesus in any way that he wanted to, right? Like, he's God. He could have, like, parted the clouds and burst through and come roaring in. He could have showed up in an instant and saved us. God could have come to this earth any way that he wanted. Yet he chose to come as a baby because it was better that way. So I wonder how often we can overlook God's miracles because they might come in ways that we don't expect them to. I wonder if the miracle you are waiting on, whatever promise that God has given you, I, that you are like have been waiting and waiting to see come to fruition, like maybe you're in here and it, it is a financial miracle and you're waiting. But I wonder, I just wonder if maybe that financial miracle, though it doesn't make sense, comes from like you giving more of your money away. Like I wonder if that financial breakthrough miracle is coming for, from you like tithing for the first time. Because that wouldn't make sense for you to get more money by giving money away. That's surely unexpected. I wonder if you're in here tonight and you are waiting for that miracle marriage. You're waiting for that miracle relationship, that redemption that God has promised you. And I wonder just, I wonder if it's coming, but it's going to take maybe you ending that relationship or cutting ties with that person who doesn't love Jesus. Or that person that you've tried to like pray and pray to like make it work. I wonder if your relationship, miracle marriage, is actually coming by way of some heartbreak. And maybe you're in here tonight and it it is a healing. Like you've been waiting for a miracle healing. Maybe it's physical, maybe it's mental, it's anxiety, depression. And you have like begged and like pleaded with God to like take this away from you. And you've like gone through as much hurt as you like possibly think that you can go through. And you've like waited for this miracle healing. But I wonder if it actually comes through like getting help and like maybe opening some wounds that are closed and that a healing can actually come by a way that you maybe never expected. Young adult, if we can learn anything through the birth of Jesus, it's that it should remind us that God's greatest miracles often come in packages that we would never expect. You can hear this story and you can look at the way that God gave us Jesus and know that it is the same God that can do a miracle in your life in a way that is just as unexpected as God becoming a baby. The story of Jesus coming to earth the way that he did should show us that God's love is so extravagant for us that he would isn't just a God that does miracles for shock value or to like prove something. He's a God that would go to the ends of the earth just to ensure that his miracles are better and matchless in every possible way. He is a God who wants to give us what he's promised, okay? And his ways are just better. They just are, okay? Hear me, young adult. Like, they're just higher, they're greater, and they're far better than anything that we could have ever hoped for or imagined. He is a miracle-working God, and he is able to do in your life what he has promised you. Would you guys stand with me? The way that God gave us Jesus, it's so much better. It's so much better than anything we could have ever expected. 
It is the greatest miracle, the greatest gift that humanity has ever received. It is the greatest gift I have ever received. And the best part is, is that because of the way that God did this, because of the lengths that he went to, this miracle, this Jesus, this life that he gained for us, it comes free of charge. Because of the way that God gave us Jesus, we can receive it free of charge. And maybe you're in here tonight and you've never received this free gift, this free miracle of Jesus Christ and you're sitting in here and your heart is like stirring and you feel something. I remember for me, it felt like my heart was like about to beat out of my chest. Can I just tell you, like that is the Holy Spirit. That is God himself trying to speak to you. The same God that went to this, these great lengths to become a baby and die on a cross, that he did that for you. That all of this was part of just how badly he never wanted to be separated from you ever again. With every eye closed and every head bowed in this room, if that is you in here tonight and you have never accepted this free gift, you have never yet yourself walked in the miracle that is Jesus Christ, but you know now is your time and you feel him calling you to start a relationship with him tonight for the first time, would you slip up your hand? Amen. Amen, I see you. And maybe you're in here tonight and you do have a relationship with Jesus but you're in here and you've been waiting. You've been waiting for a miracle. God has given you a promise and you've been waiting for what feels like forever and you might need to be reminded of some hope. Listen, can I just tell you that's me in here tonight? Like I have been promised something by God and I've been desperate to see it come to fruition. So can I just say I'm with you if that's you in here tonight and you need to be reminded and you need to hold on to this hope that is the story of Jesus and you need to be reminded that God can bring about a miracle in your life in a way that you might not be expecting. Could you slip up your hand so I could pray with you? Amen, I see you, I'm with you, I'm with you. God, we just thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you that your love for us is so wild, it's so extravagant, that you would go these great lengths, Jesus, that you would humble yourself to the point of becoming a baby, becoming man, taking on flesh, just so that you could be face to face with us, Jesus. God, we thank you that even then, that still wasn't enough for you, Jesus, that you did this miracle in such a way so that you could ensure that you would never be apart from your creation ever again. You would never be apart from a thing that you, the people that you love so much, Jesus. God, we thank you that you are a king that can do miracles in a way that no one else can. In maybe ways that are so unexpected, God, we just pray that our eyes would be open to, the, to who you are, to who Jesus has been, Lord, and that we would, our hope would be restored, Jesus, that we would have new expectancy rise up in us for what you can do, Jesus, and that we would never approach this Christmas season or look at this story and ever be able to overlook it ever again because we know that you did everything in the way that you did so that we could have the best possible miracle that the world has ever seen. God, we love you, and it is our honor to worship you and praise you, God. This is all for you. We love you. It's in your precious, powerful, mighty, incomparable name of Jesus Christ that we pray. And everybody said, amen.